Welcome to St Alfred's Online. My name is Peter McPherson. It's great that you can join us and I hope this service really encourages you. Mark Simon will be preaching later in the service from our series in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 3 verse 15, the Apostle Peter tells the people in Jerusalem this. He says, You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. The author of life is the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a wonderful title for Jesus. It points to the life-giving power that is in his name. Join with me in saying this verse from Hebrews chapter 12, which picks up the same idea. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let us pray as we begin our service. Dear God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you that Jesus is the author of life and the author and perfecter of our faith. We thank you for the new life we have in him. Help us to keep our eyes fixed on him. Thank you that he endured the cross for us. And thank you that he is seated at the right hand of the Father, reigning in power and majesty. We now lift our hearts to him in praise and adoration. Please join in as we sing our opening song of praise. Be the center 
it's this way. I'm, I'm here in, in like the 100 acres. Now, it's not the same 100 acres from the Winnie the Pooh store with, with Tigger. No, no, it's a different 100 acres. We're here in Park Orchards. Uh, it's a suburb of Melbourne. And the, the thing about this park is it it's just, everything looks the same. It's just surrounded by these trees. Uh, they're all really tall and they've all got bark on them. They're brown with leaves sticking out all over the place. Like, like that one. And this one. And this one. And this one. Like this tree. And this one. They're everywhere and it's so hard to work out where you're going. And there's all these paths and they're little and they're, they're narrow and, and they're dirt and, and they go around the back of the trees and they wind up and down the hills and all over the place. And it's so easy to get lost. What you really need if you're in a park like this, something like this, I have it on my phone. This, this is a compass. Now, there's a little red dot here, and the red dot always points north. Sometimes they have a little stick, and it always shows you which way north is, and it'll help you find your way. Now, it doesn't help you know what's right around the next corner, but it does mean that you can always be sure you're not just walking around in circles, because you know where north is, and you know which way you might need to go. Well, our Bible is a little bit like a compass because it helps us uh, know things. It doesn't point north, it actually just points to the truth, the truth that Jesus is God. And the whole Bible is geared to tell us that fact. In fact, uh, in the book of Acts, which is in the New Testament, which is the, the bit of the Bible which is after Jesus is born, he's died on the cross, raised from the dead, and gone back to be in heaven again. Well, there, the Apostle Peter is trying to convince people uh, that the man who got healed, the, the, the lame man who could never walk, who's suddenly walking around and jumping and leaping and praising God, well, it wasn't through his power, through Peter's power, that this guy got healed. He's trying to show them that it's actually through the power of Jesus, the name of Jesus Christ, that he was raised. And he starts pointing to the Old Testament, saying that even the Old Testament, which is the bit that's before Jesus was born and died on the cross and raised again and went back to be in heaven. Well, even that is pointing towards Jesus as God. And he, he names some of the really big names from the Old Testament. He talks about uh, Samuel and Abraham and Moses. And he says that even they are pointing to Jesus. So where we are now in history, we can know that the whole Bible helps us see that Jesus really is God. It is a compass and it points to him the whole time. So don't just have a, a Bible at home and don't just leave it on your shelf. You should actually read it because it might help you find your way in the world when things are really confusing and hard and we don't know what to do. It will point us to God and help us know Jesus and help us to know the way. Well, I think if I should go and try and find my car. Um, No, no, it's this way. Ooh, made it. Now Where's the car? Tigger! Today's Bible reading is Acts 3, 17 to 26. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent then and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah, who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything, as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. 
And Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from their people. Indeed, beginning with Samuel, all the prophets who have spoken have foretold these days. And you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, Through your offspring all peoples on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. When our children were younger, we read the wonderful book series, How to Train Your Dragon by Cressida Cowell. It tells the story of a Viking tribe known as the Hairy Hooligans, and they are led by Chief Stoic the Vast. The tribe is constantly at war with other tribes, and Viking children have to capture and train a fierce dragon as a rite of passage. The son of the chief is known as Hiccup, and is a scrawny, physically weak boy who everyone assumes is useless as a Viking warrior. The books could also be called The Misadventures of Hiccup, because it emerges that he, rather than the bigger, better looking, more masculine, more treacherous, more thuggish other characters, he is the one capable of saving the tribe and their island home. Hiccup is an unexpected hero who emerges against all odds as able to save everyone, including the ones who scorned, belittled and rejected him for failing to meet their expectations. The books of Luke and Acts describe a comparable unexpected hero, a man rejected by his own, scorned, belittled, and ultimately killed for his failure to conform to the patterns of behaviour the leaders of his society demanded of everyone. His name was Jesus, and in Acts we see his small but growing band of followers sharing the unexpected news of the world's unexpected hero, Jesus. Here in Acts 3, a group of those who had rejected Jesus have just gathered in response to a miraculous healing, a man born lame who has eked out a living by begging has just been healed in the name of Jesus. And Peter makes a speech explaining what has happened and how they must respond. This healing is further proof that Jesus has the power beyond the grave because he was no ordinary man. In fact, his power to heal and his power to change lives are indicators that he is the one who is now active from heaven and bringing about God's plan to heal the whole world. And Peter therefore explains to his listeners that Jesus' death was no accident, no unfortunate miscarriage of justice, but it was the focal point of history. Jesus is the answer to Israel's needs. And since this has all come to light in recent weeks, Peter says, now is the time for you to act. We heard the first part of his speech last week. Peter opened up without mincing words. He said in verse 13, you handed him over to be killed and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. The crowd had got swept away in an act of mob justice which was fundamentally unjust. Verse 14 continues, You disowned the Holy and Righteous One and asked that a murderer be released to you. In sum, they were culpable for Jesus' death. But then, Peter says, even though it was a heinous injustice, it was part of God's plan. Verse 18 says this, this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Peter doesn't immediately cite which prophets had foretold the death of Jesus, 
But as we keep reading Acts and we hear the other speeches by Peter and other apostles and, and followers of Jesus, certain passages come into prominence. And one of the main ones is Isaiah 53. In verse 5 of Isaiah 53, it speaks of God's servant, saying, He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Verse 11, after he had suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. This righteous servant will justify many and bear their sins. Just like the wartime sacrifices of the Anzacs laid the foundation for Australian liberty in the 20th century, the sacrifice of Jesus was redemptive. Through his suffering, others were given an opportunity to live. Now I want to jump to the world of the 21st century. We live in a troubled world, in need of a hero. Earlier this week, thousands of women gathered at sites across the country demanding action be taken to tackle gender-based violence. They're calling out an uncomfortable truth that our society has not sufficiently challenged sexist attitudes and structures that treat women as lesser than men. In Myanmar, a military coup has taken place and millions of citizens are protesting the theft of their democratic aspirations and their political rights. They object to life under the shadow of a military fist. Our world furnishes daily examples of how humanity is capable of inflicting suffering on those who are weaker, those who are vulnerable, those who have been oppressed by systems built on privilege and power. But those issues, maybe you think, well, they're a bit out there. Perhaps you see them as other people's problems. As individuals in the modern Western world, though, there are signs that we too are personally complicit in the kind of sins, in the sins that took Jesus to the cross. Today, it's normal for teens and young adults to kind of cobble together their own uh, vision and, and, and moral rule book for life. They're fed a, a cocktail of values which are centered on self. Do your best, look your best. Strive to be happy. Strive to live up to your potential. Be more efficient. Network more. Self-promote more. This barrage of obligations has produced a generation that feels more stressed, less happy, less relationally stable in their families and friendships than ever before. This focus on self and achievements turns out to be a prison, not liberty for many. And what we see in the world today are symptoms both of social but also personal disconnection and dysfunction. There's a longing in each of us for healing and wholeness. But we've been trying to fill that longing through the wrong things. Some strive to feel whole by their achievements or performance. Some strive to feel whole by chasing the most intense experiences, whether from, from drugs, from thrill-seeking, from pleasure, or from the affirmation of friends or followers. Some strive to feel whole by exercising power. They work their way into leadership, and then they get to control how other people live. And too often, such exercises of power end up being manipulative or discriminatory, or abusive. We live in a troubled world, and we need a hero to help us out of this mess. Now the lame man, back in Acts 3, that asked for help from Peter and John, didn't know that he could be healed. He didn't know there was a possibility of a new life for him. 
He just saw the troubled world, his troubled world, as his daily reality. But there was a possibility. Jesus was the unexpected hero about to transform his life through an unexpected miracle of healing. And for the Jerusalem crowd that then gathered and listened to Peter, they didn't realize God was offering them an unexpected wholeness and healing until Peter laid it all out for them. And let's see now what that unexpected healing meant for the original audience that Peter addressed before I turn back to draw out some implications for us today. Peter wants his audience to find forgiveness and a new beginning in Jesus. This unexpected hero brings unexpected blessings. In verse 17, Peter says they were acting in ignorance. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. He doesn't say this to excuse them, nor to imply that forgiveness was unnecessary, but to show why it was possible. Peter was echoing the Old Testament distinction between sins of ignorance and sins of presumption. God knows our heart, and he has graciously made a way for both intentional and unintentional sins to be wiped clean. Verse 19 explains how. Repent, then, and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Repentance. Doing an about-face and starting a new way of thinking and living would enable three successive blessings to take place. And the first blessing is that your sins may be wiped out. Verse 19. Even their sin of putting to death the author of life. That word wiped out means to wash off, to erase or obliterate. Our sins, rather than being an indelible stain against us, are shown to be like the food stains in a laundry detergent ad. They dissolve completely away under the power of Jesus' sacrifice in our place and they leave us wearing a robe of pure white. The second blessing is that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. This is also in verse 19. When I was in high school, I went on a hiking camp in the hills near Canberra. After a particularly long day's trekking, we were nearly at the camp uh, campsite for that night and all of us were so tired we'd we'd started talking uh, towards the end of the afternoon that maybe we should just uh, boil some water and do some two-minute noodles and just fall into our sleeping bags because we were that tired. But then as we rounded a bend in the road uh, what did we see but a van just pulling up from base camp from the YMCA site that we'd set out from a few days ago. They drove up they set up some tables and they pulled out of the back of the van hot, filled, uh, uh, hot dishes full of an amazing meal which restored our energy and our spirits. Now when you repent of rejecting Jesus and living without reference to God's ways, it brings refreshing. It brings a smile to your face, a spring to your step, a joy in your heart and a love that wants to bless others around you. Repentance brings refreshing. And the third promised blessing is stated in verse 20. That God may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, that is Jesus. So we're living in an in-between time when healing and new life in Jesus has been revealed and has been opened up to all who will welcome it, all who will accept it. But creation as a whole is still groaning under the weight of systemic sin. It means that a fuller restoration of the world, a more complete work of personal and global healing is yet to come. It's still in the future. And that final perfection awaits the return of Christ. In the last section of Peter's speech, he describes Jesus as the prophet promised by Moses. 
And he says that Samuel's promises were looking forward to Jesus as well. And that Abraham too, regarded as the forefather of the whole nation of Israel, had received a promise from God that indeed pointed to Jesus. The promise that people from all nations, not just Israel, all nations would be blessed through a descendant of Abraham. Nevertheless, Israel still had a privileged position. Verse 26, when God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you, to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. At every key moment in Israel's history, God was putting out road signs, markers to alert his people so that they would recognize and turn to Jesus when he came. And even though each of them had those who were gathered to hear Peter that day, even though they were complicit and culpable for Jesus' death, God had prepared the way for them not to be condemned or cut off from belonging, not to miss out on peace and blessing. He had prepared a way for them to be welcomed into fellowship with God and the full and satisfying life that God had always intended for humanity. How good is that? The unexpected hero Jesus, rejected by his own people, but vindicated by God. He is the fulfillment of Old Testament promises and the prophecies that look to a time of blessing for all. He is the author and giver of life and wholeness. Physical healing to the lame man, spiritual healing to those who will repent of ignoring or rejecting him. So let me echo Peter's call to his original audience and update it for the circumstances we find ourselves in today. Let me encourage you to find in Jesus the unexpected blessings of healing and wholeness. If you've been building your life on achievements or performance, and you suspect or you've realized that actually that's a treadmill with no off switch. If you have put pleasure as your goal in life and you've discovered like the Rolling Stones, that no matter how hard you try when you're chasing erotic pleasure or or substance-based pleasure or the pleasures made possible by wealth, you can't get no satisfaction. Sure, you might get temporary highs, maybe temporary bliss, temporary numbness, temporary acceptance, but these always fade. The problem, you, the problem we all run up against is spiritual. God has made us so that we find satisfaction and significance and acceptance in him. And when we put other things at the center of our lives, when we push God out of the picture, when we treat him as an optional extra, we get a taste of spiritual death. Our lives are darkened a little by the shadow of hell. See, without God at the center, our identity and our relationships and our impact on the world gets distorted and it turns ugly. And that's why the world is the mess it is. That's the reason for the personal and social disconnection and dysfunction that marks modern life. But Jesus came to fix the mess we've created and to bring forgiveness and refreshing to our mixed up lives. Jesus took the ugliness of the sinful world and put it to death on the cross. Jesus took our hurt and our shame, our wrong priorities, our tainted love, and he let it die. He put it to death in his crucified body. And then he offers us the great exchange. He says, here, take my perfect righteousness instead. He offers us a new identity without blemish or stain, a new vision of what life is all about, a new set of values, a new way of relating to God, a new way of relating to each other. It's a taste of heaven instead of a life lived in the shadow of hell. How do we receive this healing and wholeness that Jesus brings? Well, the principles are there in verses 18 and 19. Firstly, we repent. 
we admit we've been going in the wrong direction. We turn away from the unsatisfying things we've been living for, that we've wrongly put at the center of our life, and we turn toward God. And secondly, we accept Jesus' death in place of the death we deserve and the hurt we've caused. Thirdly, we ask Jesus to come to be the center of our lives. We ask him to heal us and make us whole and help us live our true identity as deeply loved children of God, growing more like Jesus every day through the work of God's Spirit. Jesus is the focal point of history. The prophets pointed forward to him. And we, as people living after his coming, we can look back and we can see how he is the denouement of the whole human story. Jesus is the unexpected hero who saves the day even when we were ignoring him and when we were sure that we could do it better ourselves. God knows best and God now invites us to make Jesus our denouement, the turning point, the revelation that straightens out our messy plot line and brings us into healing and wholeness. The message of the whole Bible points to him, Jesus at the center. So turn to Jesus and live. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us the gift of prayer. We declare that you are a God who is full of compassion, whose mercy and love is as vast as the ocean, whose goodness knows no bounds. Thank you for your presence with us now, for hearing and answering the cries of our hearts, spoken and unspoken. Thank you for the gift of life in your son, Jesus, that for anyone who acknowledges their sin and turns away from it, putting their trust in Jesus, there is forgiveness and abundant life now and the promise of life forever with you. Lord, make that reality and hope more real to us, that we stand accepted and forgiven, and that nothing can separate us from your love. As Jesus wept over the lost of Jerusalem, please move our hearts to have compassion on those around us who do not know Jesus, our neighbours, classmates, colleagues, family members and friends. Lord, this life is fleeting, And it's the only one you've given us. Please give us a heavenly mindset that we might live first for Jesus. Make our lives attractive to those around us. Help us to choose love rather than hate. Joy and thankfulness instead of bitterness and discontentment. Peace instead of strife. Hope instead of despair. Self-control instead of instant gratification. Gentleness in the place of harshness so that the world might be drawn to you in us and we would have opportunities to share our hope. Thank you for the Winter Shelter Initiative, which is part of the Whitehorse Church's care. We thank you for the opportunity to serve those in our community in need of crisis accommodation, food and friendship. We pray that among that 150 volunteers who are needed, that lots of Christians will sign up to serve and that they will be able to testify to other volunteers as well as users of the service of the love of Christ, both in the way they serve and in the things that they say. And if this is something you would have us consider, please prepare our hearts and give us the willingness to serve. May you receive all the glory for this ministry. We pray for those serving further afield, our missionaries and link missionaries, We pray with M and K for the safe arrival of their co-workers in the coming week and praise God for giving them, M and K, a relaxing week recently. We pray for the Littles in Mariba and remember their children today. For Theo who attends Kids Club run by their church. We pray that as it becomes more deliberate at targeting the different age groups, that this will encourage him and help him grow in his faith. We thank you that Annabelle has been brave as she started grade one and her new class. We pray that she makes some good friends and grows in confidence in this class. 
Thank you for how well Eden is settling back at Kindy. Please continue to shape her heart and mind to know and love Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for Lauren's ministry to university students at Swinburne and pray that you'd raise up new financial partners so that she can increase her hours from two and a half days to full time. We give you thanks for the 75 Monash students who've attended the kickoff camp this weekend. And we pray, Lord, that you would use the deepening of relationships to inspire students to keep coming along and growing in their faith. And please sustain Amy as she serves there. We recognise and give you thanks that Australia, having one of the best health systems in the world, has been able to combat the virus so well. And we ask that we and other nations in similar positions would continue and increase our commitment to poorer countries facing a far more serious situation. Thank you for the End COVID for All campaign. And we ask that we would be generous with the incredible wealth and resources that you have given us. We pray too for a peaceful resolution to the situation in Myanmar. And Father, we bring before you the grave problem of sexual abuse and violence against women in our society and the world. We ask that those in our midst and beyond who have experienced the trauma of abuse would receive healing in Jesus' powerful name. We ask that women and girls at all levels of society would be treated with respect and dignity and would be safe. Let us, your people, lead the way in honouring and respecting all women and girls, both in our public and our private lives. The pornography industry works so powerfully against us. For those in our midst with a porn addiction, we pray for courage to acknowledge this to someone, for shame to not keep people silent. Thank you that in you we find abundant mercy and grace to cover our sin and make us new. So we pray that today you would set people free from porn addiction. And now we pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
This year we're beginning an exciting new uh, program with um, other churches in the Whitehorse area under the banner of Whitehorse Churches Care. Uh, it's a ministry that's called Winter Shelter and the aim is to provide accommodation uh, during the winter months in churches in Whitehorse for people who are homeless. I'd like you just to watch this short promotional clip that explains a little bit more about the winter shelter because we're looking now for a couple of hundred volunteers from all the churches to get involved with this new program. Please watch this clip. Hi everyone. The issue of homelessness in our city is becoming increasingly apparent. Most of us probably wonder, how can I be involved? How can I help in some way because the problem seems so big? Whilst the Victorian government housed many homeless people in hotels over COVID in 2020, and this year there have been some steps taken to place those people in housing, inevitably some people will slip through the cracks. Indeed, sometimes our churches meet homeless people as they visit us for food parcels during the week. Whitehorse Winter Shelter is an initiative of the 30 or so combined churches in the Whitehorse area to provide accommodation for up to 10 people for the 12 weeks of winter, seven nights a week. Seven churches are hosting one of these nights each week with a combined volunteer team of anyone over 18 with a working with children's check and you don't have to attend a church to be involved. Is it time for you to become face to face with this issue? But also to know that you've played a part in serving some of the most challenged people in our community. There'll be teams cooking the evening meals, preparing breakfast and teams sleeping over. You could offer just one night of 2021 to serve and imagine inviting one friend or work colleague to join you and share the experience. Information sessions are happening soon, so jump on the Whitehorse Churches Care website to lock one of those in or to sign up to volunteer. 
Now, just some other notices before we finish our service. Uh, we're coming up to Easter and it's very exciting this year that we can actually have Easter services. You'll remember last year due to COVID, we couldn't meet. So the staff team and I have been discussing how best to accommodate everybody for Easter. And so we've got a whole range of services on Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Here's the rundown for Good Friday. On Good Friday morning, there'll be a 10 a.m. service and there'll be a children's uh, service running concurrently with that. In the afternoon at 3 p.m., I will then run a very quiet and reflective service for about an hour or so, particularly giving space for people who may not have been able to come in the morning service. And then in the evening, there will be the praise and worship service that we've run for many years on Good Friday. On Easter Sunday, uh, we'll have our normal Sunday services, except in the morning, we're going to run two morning services. So on Easter Sunday, there'll be a 9 a.m. service with a children's program running concurrently. The service will go for about an hour. Then there'll be an 11 a.m. service. It'll be just the same as the 9 a.m., except there won't be a children's program. Then a 4 p.m. service and the 6 p.m. service. There'll also be services at St. Luke's and there'll be services online. My hope is that with all of these various Easter services, you will find at least one opportunity to come to church. Maybe you'll be able to come both Friday and Sunday. So there are lots of services. Please register online. The last thing I'd just like to mention is that uh, the Youth Pulse Camp is happening uh, during the school holidays in April and registrations close this weekend. Please go again to our online website, our events page, and register there, please, this weekend. It's really important. It'll be a really great weekend, and we're looking forward to it. Now let us conclude by praying this final prayer as we finish our service today. Eternal God and Father, by whose power we are created, and by whose love we are redeemed, guide and strengthen us by your Spirit that we may give ourselves to your service and live this day in love to one another and to you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.